I'm loving it. <laughs> Unbelievable. I'm sitting here in the midst of February. Okay, maybe is it midst? Yeah, midst of February. And I got poems. Voila. Psych I think they're cyclones. See, I'm pretending like I know what I'm doing. <laughs> that should give it away. Sterling White Cyclamens. That's so I can act like I know what I'm talking about. But I was thrilled when we heard the weather report's going to move back up into some more weather because my bulbs are beginning to come up and I'm ready to tell my wife, let's go get veggies so that we can start planting because as you can see we have containers for growing veggies and we have a big porch that goes way down there and way around here. And man, it's kind of like cool. <laughs> I like dirt. Matter of fact, I just love getting my fingers into it. Just something about it, you know. Just the, I don't know. Love growing things, you know. I love getting back into the dirt, you know. I was born in the city. I don't know if I've shared this too many times. <laughs> so if you get bored, oh well. But I was actually born in Los Angeles, California. At the time I was born, it was a uh, kind of a pretty hairy neighborhood, East LA. And uh, for us, my mother was a truck stop waitress, so she pretty much got along with everybody. But I didn't see her much because she worked days, and uh, my babysitter was black, so she was, you know, taking care of me. And my first memories were, you know, kind of like. Uh, the way I tell my childhood stories is that I was shocked the first time I saw my first white kid because I thought I was the only one. <laughs> no, I'm not prejudiced. That's a joke. But the point is, is that I grew up in LA. And, you know, we're a multinational, multicultural area. You know, and I never had any preconceived notions one way or the other. You know, I mean, I grew up with you know just about every culture you can imagine. And I enjoy it now as an adult. But my point being is that having been in the city, we grew up as I went to elementary school, you know, and moved over to Santa Ana and then went to elementary school there. But then we moved outside of Orange County to a place called Norco. <laughs> Horse country. <laughs> Way out by Riverside, out in the boonies, you know, kind of in between Riverside and, and uh Orange County, which is Corona Norco. And uh, so I grew up in high school and junior high with horses and chickens and, and all kinds of things that you wouldn't normally associate a city kid as having. And we had a quarter acre, you know, which was nice. So we had a bunch of horses, we had a goat, we had, you know, cats and dogs, you know, and rats in the back, you know, because the people behind us, they had, I guess, maybe two acres or something. And so what they would do is they'd raise cattle you know, and then they were 4-H, so they had all kinds of animals, you know, they were always getting new animals, you know, to raise, and so they'd graze big rats one time, and then giant turtles another time, and then something else, and so we had animals all over the place, you know, and we uh, also had plenty of room to grow things, so I learned how to enjoy gardening, you know, and I, I worked at Brogan's Ranch, and I did gardening there, and I took care of Arabian horses, you know, and it was neat, it was kind of cool, you know, so Eventually, when I got older and got saved, you know, and I was in Southern Cal, and I had gotten kind of into just being a salesman, so to speak, because the only one time that I was in sales that I uh, was making so much money that I kind of backslid, you know, I went away from the Lord, and I was making a lot of money, you know, and that kind of led me astray, and I was making too much money. <laughs> so. You know, I enjoy dancing, so I'd go out dancing, you know, or try to go dancing, you know, but people liked me because I had all the clothes, and I had the car, you know, and I had the money, and you know, lots of friends. But one day I looked in the mirror and I said, who are you? you know, I didn't like who I saw, so I gave up all my clothes and left my car behind and I hitchhiked all the way to Oregon. And the first man I worked for was a Russian. <laughs> he was like maybe second... I think he was second generation 
American, but you know, he was from Russia. And uh, he ran a pot dip and bag assembly machine, you know, for the potato fields. And that man taught me how to work, you know, and he tried to break my chops, you know, and tried to bust me because, you know, I, I told him I wanted a job and I was willing to work no matter what. And I would stay at it till, you know, I learned a trade profession to be a, it was a, called a pressman. So I was an apprentice pressman. But it was a lot of hard work, you know, and so I learned sand, you know, I learned how to hold my own, I learned how to have a backbone, how to be tough. Now, supposedly the Marine Corps was going to teach me that, but with Crohn's disease and everything that affected me, you know, that kind of messed all that up. So I learned a lot while I spent my 10 years staying broke in Oregon <laughs> and working lots of other jobs and going through lots of experiences. But the one thing that I enjoyed was that. Having been in the country and having been in the city, I can enjoy now living in Sacramento and being able to have my my country in pots, you know, in containers and using them as analogies for teaching and for ministry, but then also to watch them grow and to blossom and to kind of get excited like God does over you when you grow and you blossom where you're planted. As you begin in your containers to sprout up. And then as he continues to water you and as he continues to cause his sun to shine upon you and his mercy and grace to flow over you, that you begin to bloom where you're planted. That you begin to show forth the glory of God. You get it? <laughs> That's kind of what I get, you know. And there's another thing about plantings and watching things grow. It takes time. It isn't like a rush job. It isn't something that you can go, hey, I'm going to put some quick grow on it and it's going to whew. Although you can't put vitamins, they will grow quicker. Or you can force you know, light on them, because I lived in Alaska where when you have 12 hours of light, they grow fast and they grow big. <laughs> it goes to show you what happens when you stay in the light as he is in the light. But the thing about the way things grow is Compared to the way we run our lives, the plants grow slow. They grow in their season. They have seasons to their growth. They sprout, they grow up, they develop a blossom, and then they bloom, and then maybe a fruit, and then maybe a stalk, and then maybe, you know, kind of get bigger and taller if they're a fruit tree and begin to increase the size of their root base and then increase the size of their stalk and then increase the size of their branches and the number of branches and then the fruit begins to multiply and then suddenly you prune it so that it bears more fruit all of that takes time and you know that's what God was talking to me about today when I was sitting looking at this garden this tulip garden that's actually early <laughs> way too early for it to be growing, that God began to tell me to slow back down. Because when I first moved into this place, I I was amazed at how I walked into this, I call it the house, it's really an apartment, but it's as big as a house, really. It's upstairs. But I was amazed at how I'd sit down in a chair and I could sit there and do nothing. and be still and enjoy the peace and enjoy the time and enjoy the quiet. One thing missing a lot of people don't realize, especially in if you're if you're kinda like most people, you know, you, you have your own little sect that you're involved in, unless you for some reason had to get outside of your comfort zone and deal in a broad-based ministry to the body of Christ. Like, say you were k Love radio station and you minister to everybody that's a Christian. Then you begin to see the wide variety of ways God moves by His Spirit. So you kind of appreciate that there's a variety of expressions and not everyone does everything the same way. <laughs> Thank God. Boy, I tell you. <laughs> A lot of people, you know, I'm glad that they're in their own little, you know, kind of containers and pots and doing their thing and growing differently because, frankly, I don't want, you know, 12 pots of white tulips. <laughs> I'd like a few other plants like cyclamens and whatever this thing is, a polka dot tree. <laughs> a 
or you know veggies I like a variety you know I don't want to eat one thing so when you have been brought out of your comfort zone you see this wide variety of what the body of Christ is like and you get blessed by it when you see those that know Jesus in different settings than yours and you kind of go wow they know Jesus too cool they don't do the same way I would but you know they know Jesus you know it's kind of like that's good for them. They enjoy it. You can tell they love it. You know, they're, they're, they're just excited about it. They're all over the place. You know, and that's not really my cup of tea, but I'm happy for them. You know, you go ahead, go enjoy the Lord. You know, God bless you. You know, and then over here, you know, people are. Yes, we know God. And then you kind of go, Lord, are you sure about them? You know, you kind of look a little straight laced. You know, kind of. You sure they're safe? And then they'll say, I was praying. And a miracle happened. My son was revived. And you just think, well, there's no way that the person could have been revived except that it was a miracle because you checked into it. You know, you really had doubts about these kind of straight-laced people, you know, because you thought, nah, come on now, that, they're too straight. And it turns out it was a miracle. And you go, well, just like Jesus said, you know, Satan can't divide Satan, so if it's a miracle, it had to have been God doing it, so God's with them, you know, and the Lord's blessing them, and they say Jesus, you know, maybe they say Christ Jesus, but, you know, they say Jesus. Whew. Of course, you know, it's kind of like people worry about the weeds that you have to pull out of containers, and you know what the weeds are, I mean, so do I, you know, so we don't have to worry about that part. We just have to recognize and enjoy the pots where they're planted, and the fact that they grow. And the thing that I was amazed was having been moved out of my comfort zone at an early age in the Lord and seeing all these different people grow, they also grow at different rates, you know? Sometimes some of these pots, man, they shoot right up. Like this tulip right here in front of me, you know, it's kind of like, well, I'll show you. This guy was the same size as this guy when I planted them. And they're all itty bitties. And they're all growing just at different rates because they're going to produce different flowers and different blooms and maybe even different fruit. So they all grow and by way of comparison, some seem slower than others. So maybe, you know, the one that blooms first might tell the other one, hey, you need to hurry up and bloom. But I think the timing is perfect for each one because in their season they bloom when they're planted and when they're supposed to grow and bloom as they are naturally doing so, as they respond to the light and the water. Because as a good gardener, you know, I'm going to keep them watered, you know, and providing good vitamins and good soil for them. So they grow at their own rate. The Lord told me about that today. You know, he said something interesting. He said, Michael, people run the race when I told them to walk with me. And I went, but Lord, he said run the race. <laughs> so what are you trying to tell me? Are you trying to contradict yourself? You know, the scriptures don't fit. You know, I mean, come on, God. You can't contradict yourself. I'm sorry. You know, it's written in the words. You've got you to live by what you said. <laughs> I didn't say that, but I thought it. <laughs> I used to say things like that to God, and God used to show me. You know, it took a while sometimes, sometimes a couple of years, but he would go, now, remember when you were saying this about this and this about this? This is what I mean. Ah, now I get it. Well, God wants us all to grow at our own rate. But he also wants us to slow down. Because a lot of times what people are doing is you don't find in Scripture God ever saying, hurry up and catch up with me. You never find anywhere in Scripture where God says, you're going too slow, move it. Get on board, get on with it. No, he says things like, watch and be ready. Or, you know, if they had known what time, the day or the hour. Or he says things like, be still and know that I am God. Wait on the Lord. As a matter of fact, 
if you do a study on haste and on hurry and on rushing, I think you find only a fool is the one that rushes ahead. And only an idiot, oh wait a minute, they don't say idiot in the word. Only someone that's stupid, oh wait a minute, they don't say stupid in the word. Only Raka, well they don't say Raka either. Only a fool in his folly rushes forward headlong into disaster. So, hmm, maybe there's a word from how slow the garden grows for you and I. Maybe there's a thought process that could say, before I speak, maybe I'll pause and consider the words I say. Maybe before I jump in, I'll pray first and ask God if He wants me to go to the left or the right, to go forward or back. You see, if you're not in a hurry, you have time to hear what God would say. Are you in a hurry today? If you're like most of us, you've always been in a hurry and you've never been as slow or walking in God's timing as He walks. The day is as a thousand years. When's the last time you took years to discover something true? Years to apply something or get ready for something? I don't think so. But I could be wrong. Nothing can hurt. The way is plain. You do not need to see far ahead. Just one step at a time with me. The same light to guide you as the host of heaven, though, the Son of Righteousness Himself, is guiding you. Only self can cast a shadow on the way. Keep self out of the way. Be more afraid of self, be more afraid of spirit unrest and of soul disturbance or of any ruffling of the spirit than of the earthquake or fire or outside forces. Don't let your peace be disturbed by your anxieties, worries, cares, frets. When you feel the absolute calm has been broken, come away with me, my love, to a place beyond all reasoning. Partake within my heart of my perfect peace. I desire for you to know me in a way you've yet to taste of. Let me pour myself upon you, enter in. Come away alone with me until your heart sings and all its resolve is full of strength and peace. These are the only times when evil can find an entrance. The forces of evil surround the city of the man's soul and are keenly alert for one such unguarded spot through which an arrow can pierce and do havoc. Remember, all that you have to do is to keep calm and happy, to be still and know I am God, to let me be your salvation. God does the rest. No evil force can hinder my power. Only you yourself have the power to do that, to upset or be upset by what you think you need to do that I have not told you to. Think when all God's mighty forces are arrayed to aid you and your poor puny self impedes their onward march by standing in the way and standing in the gap when I am the one who is called to do that. I don't know about you, but all the saints See, I don't normally call too many people in this life saints, but there's kind of a few, you know, kind of like people that have kind of gone, man, there's something different about them. Matter of fact, I've kind of looked at them and said, hmm, they seem to be peaceful. That's kind of different. Kind of looked over at them and said, hmm, they seem to be happy. Well, that's kind of weird. Hmm, they seem to have a calm response to every 
crisis I seem to throw at them, whether it be 9-11, <gasps> magnitude 6.0 earthquake, <gasps> Iran, Iraq, oh no, <laughs> hmm, 9-11, <gasps> or the stock market's crashing, <gasps> it's funny, I think there's a scripture that says none of these things move me. And yet I know a lot of people that react to those very words every single day, every day, even now. They overreact, they rush forward in reaction as opposed to waiting on the Lord and taking a proper action. Are you in a hurry? There's a song that Tom Stipes from Love Song used to sing. Yes, I think it was him. Yeah, it was Tom Stipes. I think it was one of his solo albums. And uh, when he first went to Maranatha Music, started organizing it. You know. And it says, don't you be in such a hurry, because it only leads to worry. There's a time to work, and there's a time to pray. Let me see. I probably have to sing it. Don't you be in such a hurry, because it only leads to worry. There's a time to work. And there's a time to pray. You need to find a quiet place to hear his voice and seek his face. Can you hear the spirit calling? Come away, come away. I think it's on Maranatha 7, as a matter of fact. It's called Come Away. And that idea should be our first response as a first responder to come away with God so that we could go forward to do what he tells us to do as opposed to run forward as a first responder thinking we know what we ought to do rather than being directed of what the Spirit says to do in today's given circumstance and situation. I don't know about you. It's like the sun is shining. I don't know about you. It feels warm on my back. <laughs> I don't know about you. But you know what? I think I'm going to come away with my love to walk away with Jesus today. To talk to him and wait for the Spirit's move. And then when He says go, then I'll go. How about you?